Well, Jordan Rayner, it is great to have you back on the podcast. It's great to see you again. And you've been such a friend and such an encouragement in my life. And you have a new book coming out, book number seven. I don't know. I've lost track. <laughs> you are a beast, my friend. I'm super, <laughs> you're just an inspiration to me. But the, the title of this book is called The Sacredness of Secular Work. And we'll just start broadly. Why did you write this book and what do you want listeners to and readers to get out of it? Yeah, it's a great question. And Doug, man, so fun to hang with you. I always love getting to converse with you. Yeah, I wrote this book because, um, you know, I spend most of my time these days creating content that helps Christians see how their work matters for eternity. And when you tell an entrepreneur or a marketer or a barista that their work quote unquote matters for eternity, the most typical response you hear is, oh, amen, my job is my mission field. And I'm like, yeah, yes, that's of course true. But if the only way our work matters to God is because we can leverage our jobs to quote unquote share the gospel, then frankly, most of us are wasting most of our time, right? Like think about it. Like how much time does somebody actually spend walking a coworker through the Romans road? And give up, <laughs> right? Like, right. Like, like, let's be like crazy generous That's and say so you spend three hours a month sharing the gospel. That means that 1% of your life matters for eternity. And I don't know about you. I find that deeply depressing, but more importantly, it's really deeply unbiblical. And so I wrote this book to help readers see how a hundred percent of their time can matter for eternity. Mm -hmm. Every zoom meeting you lead, every Uber you drive, every story you write, every diaper you change is as the apostle Paul says in first Corinthians 15, 58, not in Vain. So that's the why behind this book to help believers see how their work matters for eternity, even when they're not quote unquote sharing the gospel. Yeah, it's so good. And I'm on mission with you. You know, I work at a, a homeless rescue mission in our city. And so literally I talk to leaders all the time. They're like, wow, it must be so amazing to get to do God's work every day. I wish I could. And I'm just like, you're totally missing it. And so yeah. To that person that has that common response to me, you know, how can they start to see more beyond just witnessing their yeah. jobs as mattering for eternity? Oh man, how much time do we have? Uh, <laughs> they, they, we, we can take a long time to unpack this. Let me give you, let me give you the quick answer. Yeah. Um, language matters. Words matter. So let's get really clear on what we're talking about. Cause that person that comes to you is like, oh, Doug, you're doing God's work. What they're saying is your work is sacred, Doug. And my job as an investment banker is secular. That's the term right. I hear thrown around yeah. all the time. That word secular literally means without God. Mm. But if you are a Christian who believes wow. that you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, the only thing you need to do to instantly make your quote unquote secular workplace sacred is walk through the front door or log on to Zoom, right? Now, so some work is clearly off limits for those who follow Jesus, right? But I'm gonna go ahead and assume that our listeners aren't like, you know, peddling pornography or exploiting the poor, doing something that overtly contradicts God's word. And if that's yeah. true, and you're doing your best to live unto God, then in the words of Charles Spurgeon, nothing is secular, hmm. everything is sacred, right? I think the more interesting question, the more life-changing question is, okay, how does that sacred work you do as a barista or working with the homeless or running a for-profit venture? How does it matter beyond the present? How does it matter for eternity? And that's the question I'm really sinking my teeth into with this project. Yeah. And in the book, I, I just thought this was fascinating to speak more on that. You said the, the Great Commission, which we all know is indeed great. Uh, it's just not only. Can yeah. you ex expand on that? I, man, I just the light bulb went off when I read that statement. I was like, wow, talk more about that. I think this might be the most deeply entrenched lie in the church today. And oh, by the way, it's a brand new lie in church history. Prior to 400 years ago, nobody interpreted Jesus' command to quote unquote, go and make disciples, what we call the Great Commission, as the exclusive mission of the church. And I would argue there are some really big problems with treating it as the only commission, right? Uh, let, me, let me just share three of those problems with you real quickly. Number one, Jesus never told us it was the only thing he called us to do in, in that text in wow. Matthew 28, Jesus said, go and make disciples of all the nations and teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. The gospels record Jesus, uh, issuing about 50 unique commands. If Jesus meant for us to interpret the great commission as the totality of our mission in life, he could have said so, but he didn't. In fact, he went out of his way to reiterate the importance 
of obeying all of his teachings. So that's the first problem with treating the Great Commission as the only commission. Mm -hmm. Jesus never did. Number two, it ironically makes us less effective at the Great Commission. Tim Keller did some great research that found that 80% or more of evangelism in the early uh, centuries of Christianity was not done by ministers or missionaries, but by mere Christians working as farmers and tent makers and mothers. And that was true in the early church. And it's likely to be true for the foreseeable future as non-Christians are more reticent than ever to darken the door of a church. Entire nations are closing their doors to missionaries. When the great commission is the only one that we hear preached in our churches. And when the only people we see on our stages at our churches are pastors and full-time missionaries, it leads those of us sitting in the pews feeling guilty about going to work in the very places most likely to make disciples in our post-Christian context. So let me give you one more reason why it's so problematic that, that we treat the Great Commission as the only commission. It blocks us from seeing the full extent to how our work matters for eternity, right? And that's really the heart of this book. If the Great Commission is the only commission, then our work only has value when mm -hmm. leveraged to the instrumental end of evangelism. And if our work only has mm -hmm. instrumental value, again, most of us are wasting most of our time. And so what we see throughout scripture from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 is that God has given humankind a dual vocation, not one commission, but two, the great commission to make disciples that we see in Matthew 28 and the first commission that we see in Genesis 1 and through line all the way to Revelation 22, simply to make culture and make this world more useful for other human beings benefit and enjoyment. And once you grasp that, that this, you have this dual vocation, the great and first commissions, now I can start to understand how a hundred percent of my time matters to God, not just those explicitly spiritual tasks of evangelism and prayer. Yeah. So if we're crea to create the world the way it ought to be to create culture, that's our second commission. I yeah. love that. Now bring that down to the people that are listening. Maybe they're a barista, maybe they're an investment banker, how how does what they do every day actually create the world the way it ought to be and actually matter for eternity? Yeah, it's really good. Really good. So to understand this, you really got to go back to Genesis 1. Genesis 1, this first commission God gave us, is the blueprint for what it means to be human. This is the blueprint for human mission. In Genesis 1, 26 through 28, God takes humanity and says, hey, here's your job. Fill the earth, subdue it, and rule over it right? Lots of interpretations as to what this means, but by and large, most people agree that this means to create culture and to make the world more useful for other human beings benefit and enjoyment in a way that honors God and his commands, right? So what does this look like for the barista, right? Or the entrepreneur? It's taking the raw materials of this world. An entrepreneur is taking the aluminum that makes up her MacBook, right? And this software that's been created with the raw materials of this world and is using it in a way to try to make the world better for other human beings. And when you do that with excellence and a heart of love and in accordance with God's commands, you're bringing God pleasure and his pleasure is eternal. There's a great one of my favorite verses, Psalm 37, 23, says that the Lord directs the steps of the godly and he delights in Every detail of their lives, every detail, wow. not just when you're writing a check to a ministry, not just when you're sharing the gospel with a coworker, everything you do at work today with excellence and love in a godly way in accordance with God's commands brings God pleasure. So how does that work matter for eternity? Well, his pleasure is eternal. He will remember these things. I think they'll fuel our conversations with the risen Christ in heaven, right? That's how this matters for eternity. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask more of your eternal perspective on this, of, about our last out, our work outlasting yeah. our lives. You know, the famous quote in Gladiator, what we do in life will echo yeah. in eternity. Um, talk more about that. What, what do you think about, do you think we'll work in heaven uh, and how our work and the, the things we do at the time we have here matter then? Yeah, so man, our, we could do a whole episode on, <laughs> um, on a theology of heaven. You know, I, I think more most people spend more time thinking about a one week vacation than they do thinking about eternity. And that's a problem 
<laughs> for a lot of reasons. Yeah. But when we do that, when we fail to think deeply about our eternal state, it, it, it leads us to accept wishy-washy half-truths about heaven peddled by culture rather than the whole truths that we find in scripture. And I actually dedicated an entire chapter of the sacredness of secular work to dispelling these half truths about heaven. One of them is that earth is our temporary home, right? That's kind of true in the sense that earth as we know it today is our temporary home. The whole truth is that this earth is our temporary home until God makes it perfect again, and it is our perfect and permanent home. You allude to another one. There's this half-truth running around the church today that um, we will worship for eternity. It leads people to have this you know, caricature of heaven as a glorified retirement home in the, the clouds where all we do is strum a harp and lyre forever and ever. That's yep. not biblical at all. Let me, let me read you an excerpt from one passage in Isaiah chapter 65. It's one of the most hopeful things in scripture, especially if you love your job, but even if you hate it. Isaiah says, see, I will create a new heavens and a new earth. This is God talking through Isaiah. I will create new heavens and a new earth. My people will build houses and dwell in them. They'll plant vineyards and eat their fruit. My chosen ones will long enjoy the work of their hands. And they will not labor in vain. God's word does not say that we will sing, Lord, I lift your name on high forever and ever or recline in a hammock forever and ever. It says that we will work with Christ and for him forever and ever. Only this is work as it was always meant to be in the Garden of Eden, right? It is work redeemed, restored. It's all of your best days at work and none of the bad ones. It is work that is challenging but satisfying, difficult but fruitful all honey and no bees. And if you love your job, man, that should fire you up for eternity. And even if you hate your job, <laughs> it should get you excited because your final destination is the work that deep down in your soul, you know, you were made to do, but for whatever reason, couldn't do in this life. That's more than likely what you're going to be spending your time doing forever and ever in a perfect state. Yeah. I'm curious, uh, you know, I'm really big on faithfulness. I define faithfulness as doing the best you can with what God puts in your hand at the moment. There's several times where Jesus said, man, my good and faithful servant, you've been faithful over litter. Now I'm going to make you ruler over much. Do you feel like the way that we are faithful or the way that we do the work here is going to determine our position? Not that it's going to be about position. I don't want to sound yep. like it's all about title, but do you feel like the level of responsibility we'll get then is, is somewhat reliant on how we use what's given to us now? I think scripture is abundantly clear that yes, that is a hundred percent true. Listen, if you are trusting in Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sins, your entrance into the kingdom of heaven is perfectly secure. And all of our entrance, all of our admission tickets look exactly the same. That said, the rewards that we experience for eternity are not created equal at all. And one of those rewards, you just alluded to one of them in the parable of the minus that Jesus tells is increased job responsibility on right. the new earth. Some will lead, others will follow. Some will, I believe, be launching rocket ships to explore the new <laughs> heavens while others are on the ground, you know, creating the rocket ships, whatever that is. We have varying rewards and responsibilities on the new earth based on how we steward this life, right? Which should motivate us to steward it really, really well. I think this is what part of what Paul was getting at in Colossians chapter three, verses 23 through 24. He says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, that inheritance is salvation, but there are eternal rewards attached to how we work in this life. And one of those are varying levels of leadership and responsibility on the new earth. I talked to Johnny Erickson Tata when I was writing this book and she said something I'll never forget. She's like, I want to live every day of this life so that I can be most useful to King Jesus in the next one. I'm like, wow. yes, that's the idea here. So I want to bring that back to today. When I started, first started getting exposed to some of these concepts, it changed everything. And, you know, to wake up excited every day and to realize that my work could be sacred, I mean, 
you know, they say, if you enjoy your work, you'll never work a day in your life. Like in some ways, can you talk about the impact that starting to get revelation and actually starting to see all work as sacred? What impact does that actually have on people that you've seen? You've, you work with people all yeah. the time, mentor people. What, what have you seen in people's lives that has transformed as a result of getting some of this in their hearts? Yeah. Um, these people, and I know because I was one of them become fully alive <laughs> Monday through Friday. So wow. many Christians are walking around today believing that if they're honest, less than 1% of their life really matters in the grand scheme of eternity. But when you can go to that person, look them in the eye, be like, no, 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 look, look, look to scripture, look at God's plan for work. Look at what he made you to do. You're doing the very thing he made you to do. See Genesis one. And the thing he redeemed you to do, see Ephesians chapter two, it makes them become fully alive. And oh, by the way, fully alive people attract the lost, like craft coffee attracts hipsters, right? Like, like <laughs> this is what the world is craving for. Right. Human beings fully alive and fully engaged in the work that God created them to do. So that's number one. It makes them fully alive. It encourages them to do to just keep doing the work that they've been doing, right? Uh, and view it as a sacred space. But number two, I think when you understand this, I think the natural implication of understanding that your work matters for eternity is a challenge to make it matter more, right? Mm -hmm. Like all work, all good work matters for eternity. Not all work at matters equally for eternity. In other words, you can have two marketing managers at the same company. We're both Christians. Both of their work is making some contribution to eternity, but one is intentionally trying to make it matter more. How? By working in accordance with God's commands to earn more eternal rewards, mm -hmm. by communing with God as she does the work, right? That brings him eternal pleasure. So the net of this book, the net of this message is, hey, be wildly encouraged that your work today matters deeply to God but also be challenged to make it matter more to spend this rounding error of a life rather than to save it. Right. Mm. Because all of us should be optimizing for the eternal. That's just good investment advice. Yeah. So in optimizing for the eternal, I am curious when you consult and encourage people on job choice, yeah. whether it's someone, you know, a young person right out of college considering what they want their path to be, or maybe someone who just starts hearing about this, maybe they are the investment banker. They always thought, Hey, once I get enough money, then I'm going to go into full-time ministry. Yep. How does one make career decisions with this, with eternity in yeah. mind and yeah. sacred work? That's a good question. I'll say this. Um, I don't think God cares nearly as much about what we do vocationally, which jobs we choose, which jobs we take, as he does who we are as we do the job, how we do the job, and why we do it, right? Wow. And I think this is part of why the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 7, he's, the Apostle Paul's writing to a group of new believers, and he's anticipating their question of, okay, man, I'm a Christian. I understand my life matters for eternity. What now? Right? What does this mean for my family? What does this mean vocationally? And he says in 1 Corinthians 7 20, hey, let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. In other words, Paul's saying, don't change jobs. Stay exactly where you at. They stay exactly where you're at. Don't change the work, but change your relationship to the work. Now work is no longer about making me famous, making me rich, glorifying myself, but I'm going to go back to the work and figure out how in the world can I do this in a way that contributes to the flourishing of other people. Now that'll lead some people in some jobs to quit those jobs, right? <laughs> right. You know, if, 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 if you're, if you, if you come to Jesus and you're currently working, um, in a company that's marketing tobacco products to underage kids doing something illegal, right? Yeah. You're probably called to leave that job, but those, those instances are few and far between. I think about Jesus's interaction with Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a tax collector, one of the most hated professions of that day. And when Zacchaeus started to follow Jesus, Jesus did not say, okay, Zacchaeus, you know what this means? Go to the office, turn in your letter of resignation and come follow me in quote unquote full-time ministry. No, Zacchaeus says, hey, I'm going to repent of the way I've been doing this work. I'm no longer going to exploit the poor. And Jesus blesses him and sends him back 
into that vocation. So some of us are going to make those calls to change jobs and that's fine. I just think God cares a lot more about how we're doing the work than what work we're doing. Because again, for the Christian who's living as unto God, nothing is secular. Everything is sacred. Yeah. And I'm curious, I would love to hear you talk about how you view your work yeah. and the work that you've chosen to do. How do you view that as sacred and really maximizing, you know, the work eternally? Yeah, that's a good question. So in addition to my writing, um, I still serve as chairman of the board of a large tech startup. And so I think a lot about that in the, the context of that. How does that matter? This company, we're building software, right? Like we're not saving souls. We're not feeding the homeless. How is that work sacred? It's sacred because again, this is what God made us to do. We are in this tech startup making the earth more useful for other human beings, benefit and enjoyment. How am I making it more sacred? How am I making it matter for eternity? I'll tell you a couple of ways. Number one, I'm always looking for ways of, okay, where are we out of step with God's commands hmm. in this venture? Where are we not explicitly exploiting the poor, but where can we proactively bless the poor through hmm. this venture? That's number wow. one. Uh, number two, I'm always looking for opportunities as I'm doing that work to do it with God, right? Um, we talk so much about doing our work for God, we forget to do it with him. So what does that mean practically? Before I log on to a Zoom meeting for a board call, right? I'm inviting the Lord's presence into that meeting. I'm ensuring that I'm doing that work with him and not just for him. And that brings him eternal pleasure. I'll give you one more, uh, a third one. I'm always looking for opportunities to move conversations with the non-Christians that I work with from the surface to the serious, to the spiritual, because I believe that it is the work of me. It is mere Christians, not religious professionals who are going to be most effective at the great commission in this cultural moment. And so I'm aware of that. I'm working alongside non-Christians, and so I'm always looking for chances to steer those conversations towards spiritual things um, as a means of sharing the hope that's within me that is found in Christ alone. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I thought you that brought it all home. Yeah. Uh, I want to take a little bit of a, a sidestep in the book, which yeah. is hilarious because I encourage everyone to have a bucket list. I'm a huge bucket list yes. fan. I have a long bucket list. You encourage <laughs> readers to make an anti-bucket list. Yeah. So I'll give you a few moments to yeah. state, your, state your case. Listen, yeah. I've got no problem with bucket lists. I'll state that on the front end, <laughs> right? Right, right? But, but. The whole concept of a bucket list assumes that the only chance we have to enjoy the best places mm. and food and experiences that this world has to offer is before we die and kick the bucket. That's a lie. That is a lie. Wow. The, scripture's vision of heaven is not us floating on clouds. Heaven is ultimately here on earth. Heaven contains the glory of the nations, quote, end quote. See Revelation 21, which means every theologian agrees the best of human culture. It also includes the best food. See the book of Isaiah that talks about the feast that we're going to experience on the new earth, right? So once we replace some of these half-truths about heaven peddled by culture with whole truths that we see in scripture, we see that we're going to have all eternity to enjoy the best food and experiences and places that this world has to offer. And to go back to what we talked about a few minutes ago, scripture also makes clear that you and I are going to have different levels of rewards for eternity. And so for that reason... And because those rewards are almost always attached to sacrifices that we make in the present, yeah, I think more Christians need to be building these anti-bucket lists, these catalogs of things that I'm going to strive not to do on this side of eternity so that I can accumulate as many eternal rewards as possible. Let me make this real concrete. Let me give a personal example. Yeah. Um, I love great cities. I love my hometown of Tampa, Florida, but it's not a world-class city. I love Washington, D.C. I love London, right? And nothing fuels my soul more than great cities. And um, I would love nothing more than to live in an urban flat in London with my family, right? So why don't I do that? Why do I choose to remain here in Tampa? Well, for a lot of reasons, but one of them is that my wife and I have parents who are not getting any younger. They're reaching their 70s. Um, and we're within a 10 mile radius of all of them. We want to be here in Tampa to care for them as they get older. Now, listen, I'm a selfish prick sometimes, right? That's a massive <laughs> sacrifice for me personally, right? Yeah. 
And if I'm living my life for this life alone, man, move our family to London would be at the top of my bucket list. But knowing that heaven is ultimately here on earth and that I'm going to have all eternity to explore a perfect London and the greatest city of all time, the new Jerusalem, I put move to London on my anti-bucket list because the apostle Paul tells me in Ephesians 6 that the Lord will reward me for whatever good I do in this life. Well, will that include an urban flat in London in the New Jerusalem? I don't know. And listen, I'm not saying if if you've got moved to London on your bucket list, that's wrong. I'm just convicted that for me, it is wrong. And so it's yeah. on my anti-bucket list. And I'm trusting, based on the promises I see about re eternal rewards, based on what scripture says about the unbelievable reality of the new earth and how epic it's going to be, I'm okay putting that on the anti-bucket list and sacrificing that right now. No, that's so good. And, and to be honest, that really challenged me because I am the guy of like, we got to do it all. And yeah. uh, and again, you do sometimes have the viewpoint of heaven of like, hey, you know, what's that? And Jesus said it's paradise. So who even knows? You can't even imagine what that would be like. But that really challenges me because it is like, hey, this isn't all there is. And we can't even imagine what kind of bucket list things we'll be able to do. Um the other thing I want you to talk about, we talked about this a little bit in our, our conversation last time, but you know, you said when someone starts getting a hold of, of seeing work as sacred, they become fully alive. And unfortunately, well, fortunately, because of your work, people are getting that revelation. But oftentimes, it's not till later in life that we hear stuff like you're writing. Yeah. I know for me, I was probably 26, 27 when I started getting exposed to that. But now, once we are, we have an opportunity to, to share that with our children. If we have young kids, I have four kids under seven. And you wrote a kid's book, which I would love for you to pitch again, because I probably read it to my kids at least twice a month. It's one of our favorites in our household. Yeah. Um, but talk to parents again about getting this subject of sacredness of work into their kids, because vitally important. It's so important, because our kids hear so many negative messages about work, um, sometimes from their parents, if we're honest. Come on. Yep. Right? Take, take, take stock of what you've said about your work and your boss around your kids in the last week uh, and put that in the positive negative column and check that out. <laughs> um, but also because we just don't have this biblical story of work. And so I, I wrote this kid's book called The Creator and You um, to help my kids see in less than three minutes what God's plan for work was in the beginning. Um you know, it's it centers around the Genesis one account, which I've read a dozen children's books to my my kids on Genesis one, and they're all the exact same, right? God created this <laughs> on day one, that on day two, day three, four, five, six, the end. And they drive me bonkers because the sixth day was not the end of creation. The sixth day, according to Genesis one, verses twenty six through twenty eight, is when God passed the baton of creation to humanity. And told us to go fill the earth, subdue it, and create like he did in those first six days, however you decide to interpret days, right? And that's a game changer. This is the first commission that we talked about a few minutes ago. And so I wrote this kid's book to help my girls uh, and all the kids out there to see it. But honestly, I wrote it as much for parents as I did for kids because parents don't get this. Parents yeah. don't understand that long before the Great Commission, there's the first commission – to just make more of this world that never, ever, ever, ever ends. We just read Isaiah 65. What are we going to be doing for eternity? The first commission of creating culture and building houses and planting vineyards, right? And when you get that, oh my gosh, that's a game changer. Now I can see the work of a doctor, the work of an entrepreneur, the work of an artist, the work of a spaceship engineer, the work of a pastor, the work of a full-time missionary. All of it is sacred. Right. And so, man, that book uh, just keeps selling and selling and selling the creator of you. And um, it's been such a blessing to me to hear from parents. Like, I am so grateful that my kids get to get this age five instead of age 35 or 55. Yeah. And I didn't even think about it from that context, but I think one reason I love it so much is it fires me up every time yes! I read it. So, so you're talking about the impact on parents? I mean, oh, man. man. I, when, when we were just talking about book publishing before we right. press record. When I pitched this book to Random House, I was like, hey, listen. Yeah, technically this is a kid's book. But this project has to feel like a Pixar movie that mm. makes five-year-olds mm. laugh and smile and 55-year-olds weep. And if we haven't yeah. done that, we've lost. And thank God they found a great illustrator who knocked out the park. The art in this book True. is not at all cute. Uh, it is not cartoony. It is 
epic and will make you cry like a five-year-old girl. Uh, it's, it's, yeah. it's incredible. Yeah. Well, mission accomplished on that. Yeah. Um, I'll have one or two more questions, but I do want people are listening to this. I know obviously they can get the book. We'll include links to that everywhere, but you do a lot around this work. You have yeah. email, like what are the best ways that people want to learn more and connect with you? What are some yeah. ways they can do that? Yeah. We get tons of free content to help you connect your faith with your work at jordanrainer.com, J-O-R-D-A-N-R-A-Y-N-O-R.com, including a weekly podcast called the Mere Christians Podcast that explores how the gospel is shaping the work of mere Christians out in the world. Those of us who aren't religious professionals but work as entrepreneurs, baristas, and accountants. Uh, we also have a weekly devotional that goes out every Monday morning called The Word Before Work that you can get for free. And then, yeah, this book that's uh, releasing January 30th of 2024, The Sacredness of Secular Work, Four Ways Your Job Matters for Eternity, Even When You're Not Sharing the Gospel. It's the longest title of all time. You will not remember it. Uh, so if you don't remember it, just search Jordan Rayner on Amazon or just go to jordanrayner.com. Yeah, you, you also mentioned a subject in the book. Uh, you argue that Christians don't grow the kingdom of God, yeah. but we can scratch off glimpses of it. Yeah. Talk more about that. It's fascinating. Yeah. You know, I'm referring to the scratch off paper that our kids love that makes my house covered in black residue. I'm not talking about gambling <laughs> scratch off. So please don't send me your angry emails. You know, on, on the surface, these scratch off, these scratch offs look like dull pieces of black paper, right? But when our kids rub the surface with a stylus or with a cord or whatever, the thin dark veil fades away mm. and it reveals this beautiful picture on the other side. That's the best picture I've ever seen of what our work has the power to do today. Through our jobs, we can serve as a stylus of sorts, scratching off the darkness of this world, anything that doesn't belong in the eternal kingdom of God, and revealing glimpses of what does belong on the other side. Let me give you a few examples. Make this a little more practical. When you as an attorney fight for justice in the courts, right? You're scratching off a glimpse of the day when the God of justice will reign supreme here on earth. See Isaiah chapter 30. Wow. When let's say let's take a, a a different vocation that the world deems as useless, but God does not. Let's let's say you're a hairstylist, right? And you're working every day just to create beauty with your clients. You're scratching off a day, a glimpse of the day when God's beauty, abundant, senseless beauty will abound. See Revelation chapter 21. When you as an executive work without fear in the face of insane challenges, when the rest of your team is anxious and worried about everything, you're scratching off a glimpse of the day when anxiety will be no more. You're rubbing off more of that scratch off and giving people a glimpse of something eternal and true. Come on. Keep preaching. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Go all day, man. Yeah. Well, I, I will just leave this open-ended as we, we start to wrap, but anything else you want to leave leaders with or anything else you want to say around the subject that would add value? Yeah, I'll say this. We've been talking a lot about how much our work matters um, to God, and it does. Our work, the story of scripture is that work is a good God-ordained thing, but nothing but Jesus is an ultimately good thing. Right? Our work matters deeply to God, but at the end of the day, until Christ comes and makes all things new, including the world of work, even if you have a dream job, work's going to disappoint you, right? Mm -hmm. The ultimate good is found in Christ alone. So embrace the goodness of work, embrace the eternal significance of work, but let's not make work an idol, right? Uh, that, that is the supremely important thing in our life. I think that's the danger in this your work matters conversation is that we treat this good created thing of work as an ultimate thing. The creator is the ultimate thing, not the created thing of work as good and as wonderful as it is. Yeah. Well, Jordan, thank you for your sacred work. Uh, it matters. It's making a difference in all of our lives. It's impacted my life. And if you're listening to this and have enjoyed this conversation, uh, we'll include a link, but we had a previous conversation with Jordan around his last book. He has seven books out there. He mentioned all the other ways you can connect. He's incredibly generous with his time and who he is. And I can't encourage you enough to connect with him. Thanks again, Jordan. And I look forward to doing this again sometime. Thanks, sir. 